All right, thank you everyone for being here. I understand there, there's a large cohort from Eureka Springs, so thank you for the travel. Holiday Island. Holiday Island. I'm sorry. There's a big cohort here from Holiday Island. Uh, uh, but, but thank you everyone for being here. Uh, for, for what, when I started this project a month or so ago when I was asked to do this topic, I thought this would be a rather dull experience and a dull presentation to say, oh, many of you I've had in class where we studied uh, the Quranic narratives talking about Noah or Abraham or Jesus, and so of course the God Allah is the same as the God Yahweh or Jehovah of the Bible. What more is there to tell? Uh, but when I decided that I would look at the internet and different group, excuse me, decided to look at the internet and different groups and what they would have to say about this relationship between uh, the Muslim deity Allah and the Christian and Jewish deity Jehovah or Yahweh, I found a lot of interesting attempts at answers to say no, they are distinct. So that's the territory that we'll be wading into tonight before this is over. Uh, so first, I'd like to explain why I think it's a fair assessment to say Allah is Jehovah. Uh, all three faiths do worship the same divine entity. And then we'll look at those who say no. And since I'm the one here and they are not, I will have the last word to say why they're wrong. Uh, so it very well could be, as I've given web addresses and names that claim to be responsible, uh, there may be, uh, we might need to cut off the comment section on this YouTube video afterward, just in case uh, the rhetoric gets too heated. Uh, but this is where we're going tonight, so I appreciate y'all being here. Uh, right about the same time I was asked to give this topic for Thursday night, uh, I encountered on Facebook uh, an article someone had posted for a Pledge of Allegiance, I, 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 for lack of a better word, scandal, uh, that happened in Colorado back in April on the 21st. Uh, here. Uh, the Cultural Arms Club led the Pledge of Allegiance at Rocky Mountain High School in Fort Collins. Uh, he led the Pledge of Allegiance in Arabic. And so where we would say one nation under God, they said one nation under Allah in Arabic. And this caused a major uproar in the town to the point where uh, this was making grounds on Facebook. And this author or this uh, journalist Rick Wells uh, wrote this article on the GOP, the Daily Dose uh, quoting, he starts by, I'll start my quote by re reference to the principal. Principal Lopez said the cultural club seeks to, quote, destroy the barriers, embrace the cultures, end quote, that exist within the high school. And then Wells continues, that would translate into, quote, destroy the barriers to Islam and embrace it. Correct, Mr. Lopez? Uh, so here, Rick Wells is suggesting just by using the word Allah in place of God, uh, we are embracing Islam rather than accepting it or promoting tolerance. We're promoting conversion of sorts. And, and Wells continues, he says, Lopez says, Lopez said, he had been getting a variety of accusations leveled at him, including being called a traitor. He said, they claim they are outraged, that this is blaspheming a real major tenet of our patriotism, which in their mind, the Pledge of Allegiance is only in English. Now, so here we have a two-part problem according to Pr Principal Lopez. One, the reference to the Muslim name Allah for the God and to the fact that it's just not in English. And as I understand, they'd had a similar protest earlier when the Pledge of Allegiance had been translated into Spanish as well. Uh, so whatever this issue is, people in Fort Collins only want to hear the Pledge of Allegiance in English. 
Uh, but Rick Wells continues. He says, the Council on American Religi Islamic Studies, excuse me, the Council on American Islamic Relations, Representative Ibrahim Hooper told Fox News he was dumbfounded by the complaints about the Arabic version of the pledge. How on earth is it un-American to recite the Pledge of Allegiance in another language, Hooper asked. It doesn't make sense unless people are com complaining, unless the people complaining are anti-Muslim or anti-Middle Eastern bigots. And then Wells responds to this comment, it might just be that Americans recognize the Islamic agenda, Mr. Hooper, and are tired of having it forced upon them. Maybe we know what you are up to and people are pushing back. Uh, so Wells here, and if you read the article, Wells is very angry. And again, I saw this article thinking that the relationship between Allah and Yahweh or Allah and the Christian God was a non-issue. So I read this article and I felt surprised, almost as though this were satirical, this exaggeration, uh, the bombastedness that the author has. But it's real, and if you Google, is Yahweh Allah, or is, Yala, is Allah Yahweh, you will find all sorts of uh, relatedly venomous and hate-filled, and or at least very scared uh, kind of comments. And so that's that's how I wanted to introduce the topic today, that this has become, for something as simple as a school pledge of allegiance, a major uh, a scandal uh, in, in recent months. Uh, so tonight what I want to do, at least in the first half, is to say, uh, despite what Wells might write, uh, Allah is Jehovah, or Allah is Yahweh, or the Muslim God is the Christian and Jewish God, as demonstrated by theological acts uh, performed by the deity, historical acts, which is to say the relationships between the worshipers, and literary evidence. And so that's what we'll look at through this first half before we look at the naysayers. Uh, first, uh, I do want to say a little bit about the name Jehovah and the name Allah just so we're all uh, on the same standing point. Uh, first, the name Jehovah is a very complicated series of misunderstandings uh, to bring us from the name Yahweh, which we think is what the deity was called in ancient Israelite times, say Moses or King David, he would have referred to his God by the personal name Yahweh or perhaps Yahu. Or, uh, but in writing, ancient Israelites only used the consonants. So the consonants for the name Yahweh are Y, H, V, H. Uh, the V kind of services like a bit of a W. This is why we have this translation issue here. And so Y, H, V, H is all that was ever written down. Uh, and then when the Bible was codified, the Bible was passed on, the scribes continued to ignore vowels. It's not really until uh, after the time of Jesus and the rise of Christendom and the rabbis over the course of the first millennium AD, uh, the rabbis and the Masoretes add vowels to the Hebrew Bible. So if you open a Hebrew Bible today, you see all these dots and lines all along these consonants. And this happens, finalizes around the 9th and 10th centuries A.D. But at this point, no Jew spoke the name Yahweh. It had long been replaced by either saying, My Lord, or in some circles they would say, The name, Hashem. But My Lord is pronounced Adonai. And so whenever they would see the four letters, Yud, He, Vav, He, or Y, H, V, H, they would say Adonai as they read the biblical script instead of Yahweh. And it, when they placed vowels into the Hebrew script, they took the vowels of the word Adonai and they inserted them into the letters or the consonants YHVH, producing uh, this here, which Yehovah or Yehovah 
would be an approximation. But again, this is a set of vowels plus a set of consonants that are being put together, producing this Yahowah or Jehovah as we've come to uh, pronounce it here in English. Uh, so this is how the name Jehovah came to be. It's uh, perhaps a, a sort of double misunderstanding of the biblical God's name. Uh, but uh, that's where it comes from. So going back, we have the biblical God's name Yahweh, which may be a verb that means he who causes or he who is. Uh, we're not really sure. Um, but the deity is often also called Elohim. Or sometimes he's called Yahweh Elohim. So a personal name followed by the name Elohim, which simply means God. Um, and it, for whatever reason in Hebrew, the name God or the word God is followed by a plural. So Elohim when Elah or Elo is the singular. Uh, so you'll see the root word. We have uh, the Aleph, the L, and the H. In Arabic, the name Allah is ultimately a translation of the word, or the, the words in English, the God. Uh, A-L, as you may know, is Arabic for the. So Al-Qaeda is the Qaeda. Al-Bakor is the tuna. Algebra is the math. Alchemy is the chemistry. Things like this. So Allah is the God, or Al-Illah. And Illah for God is the same root word, Aleph L H, that we see in the Hebrew Elohim. Uh, so they are related, uh, just sister words in two different sister languages from the same root. Um, and so here, Allah, or Al Illa, contracted to Allah, is the name of the deity in Islam. Uh, so that's a little bit of a relation. Uh, one thing to note, and this will come in handy later, when the Hebrew Bible is translated, or the Old Testament is translated into Greek in the, second, in the third and second centuries BC, uh, because Jews no longer said Yahweh, they were saying Adonai, uh, that my Lord, Adonai, gets translated as Lord into Greek. So Kyrios. Anytime you see Lord, in the Old Testament or the New Testament, the Greek behind it would be Kyrios. And sometimes Elohim would be translated Theos, which is the Greek word for God. Uh, sometimes it's translated as other things, uh, but that's what's going on. Uh, so just to be aware as we encounter some complaints <coughs> earlier. All right, uh, so, so that's the naming background to all this. And now let's move into the theological evidence. And I want to do it by reciting these verses. And as I will contend, everyone listening here tonight would feel comfortable using this text in worship in any Sunday morning church. Uh, it goes, Whatever is in the heavens and on earth declares the praises and glory of God, for He is the exalted in might, the wise. To Him belongs the denomination, dominion, or kingdom of the heavens and uh, the earth. It is he who gives life and death, and he has power over all things. He is the first and the last, the evident and the hidden. He has full knowledge of all things. It is he who created the heavens and the earth in six days. Then he established himself on the throne. He knows what enters within the earth and what comes forth out of it, what comes down from heaven and what mounts up to it. And he is with you wherever you may be. And God sees well all that you do. To him belong the dominion of the heavens and the earth, and all affairs go back to God. He merges night into day, and he merges day into night, and he has full knowledge of the secrets of all hearts. As I understand Christianity, this is wholly compatible with everything that Christianity teaches today. As I understand Judaism, this uh, set of verses is wholly compatible with everything that Judaism teaches today. This just so happens to be uh, chapter 57, or Surah 57, from the Quran. But it also uh, 
says everything that is wholly compatible naturally with Islam and Muslim thought today. But as again, you see, not only is God all knowing, all powerful, He creates the world in six days and He is enthroned upon it. Uh, so, theologically, all three religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, fit together under this same uh, reverence. And as I mentioned, Yahweh or Allah, because every time I actually read God here in this text, the translation is actually the God or Allah. Uh, his creation in six days and six nights and been able to turn night into day, we find in the Quran that this Allah only needs to speak and things can happen. In 1640, it says, For anything which we have willed, we but say, Be, and it is. Uh, one qualifier real quick. Anytime you see the word we, when you read the Quran, you're talking about the angelic messengers that Allah sends to Muhammad. So they're relating uh, what Allah has done. And this is what the we is in reference to. Uh, so again, the deity needs only speak be, or as we know from Genesis 1, let there be light. Let there be dry land. And the angels tell Muhammad uh, in another time, in Surah 3, chapter verse 47, it says, Mary said, O my Lord, how shall I have a son when no man has touched me? And he said, Even so, God creates what he will. When he has decreed a matter, he but says to it, Be, and it is. Uh, so this deity creates in the same way. Here the reference is, all the needs only to say, be, and Jesus will be conceived inside Mary. Uh, but again, the same method of creation. And then we have another text, uh, ch chapter 32, verses 7 through 9. We have another moment of creation that Allah is being described here. He who created all things in the best way, and he began the creation of man from clay just as we know from Genesis 2. And he made his progeny from a quintessence of de despised fluid. But he fashioned him in due proportion and breathed into him of his spirit. Again, something very familiar from Genesis 2. And he gave you hearing and sight and understanding. And then he gives a little dig to humanity. Little thanks do you give. Uh, so uh, the deity creates the world in the same way in Islam, in the Quran, as he does in the Jewish and Christian traditions. Uh, similarly, uh, God's agents, or Yahweh's agents, or Jehovah's agents, or Allah's agents, are the same. Gabriel is the angel who speaks in the Quran to Muhammad. Michael is also represented. And we find both of them in Surah or chapter 298. Whoever is an enemy to Allah and his angels and prophets, or to Gabriel and to Michael, lo, Allah is an enemy to those who reject the faith. And he also has the same uh, supernatural enemy, Satan, uh, which uh, in Arabic is Shaitan, and the individual is also known as Iblis. And then here we have a story from that you are familiar from Genesis chapter 3, the fall. We have it, O Adam, dwell you and your wife in the garden, and enjoy it as you wish. But approach not this tree, lest you become of the unjust. So that's the warning. And then verse 20, Then Satan began to whisper suggestions to them in order to reveal to them their shame. So by deceit, he brought about their fall when they tasted of the tree. Uh, so we have the same actors bringing about the fall, and here we get uh, the serpent or the snake, or here the Satan, very much deceiving Adam and Eve, tricking them into taking the apple for the fall, which theologically is more explicit than Genesis 3 itself is. One, it's simply the serpent in Genesis 3, Two, if you read Genesis 3 carefully, the serpent is actually not deceiving. He's 
simply stating the truth. And three, we don't actually have the word the fall occur in Genesis 3. Now, that's something that later theologians like Augustine bring into the mix. Here though, the Christian theology is very much present in the Quranic text. So the same aids and the same opponents for this deity. And just like in Christianity, we expect uh, Allah or Jehovah to be a judge or bring on the judgment. 95.8 is not Allah the wisest of judges. Or in 44, the day of sorting out is the time appointed for all of them. The day when no protector can avail his client in aught and no help can they receive except such as receive God's mercy or Allah's mercy for he is exalted in might most merciful. So here, the believer only benefits by divine mercy. There is nothing else to help him, which is very much the Christian mentality. And then, in regard to the Christian view of resurrection and final judgment, we have in Surah 82 a, a poem, When the sky is cleft asunder, when the stars are scattered, when the oceans are suffered to burst forth, and when the graves are turned upside down, a reference to resurrection, shall each soul know what it sent forward and what it kept back, all its doings. And then skip down to 13. As for the righteous, they will be in bliss, and the wicked, they will be in fire, which they will enter on the day of judgment, and they will not be able to keep away therefrom. And what will explain to you what the day of judgment is, and then verse 18 says the same thing. 19, the day when no soul shall have power to do anything for another. For the command that day will wholly be with God or with Allah. So it's not exactly perhaps how you picture uh, Paul's story of the resurrection in 1 Thessalonians or 1 Corinthians. It's not exactly how you expect the resurrection and judgment day to be when you read Revelation. But the major themes are there. And truth be told, if you've read 1 th Thessalonians and 1 Corinthians, you're not going to expect anything you find when you turn to Revelation. Uh, so it's only fair that you allow for some uh, disjunction between these. But the major point is the same. In the last day, there will be a resurrection. The faithful, the righteous will be saved. The wicked will be tossed into a lake of fire. Uh, then briefly, uh, so that's the historic or the theological reasons I see. You have the God who acts in the same ways. You have the same friends and opponents. And you have the same enemies bringing you to the judgment and resurrection. Uh, theologically, I feel we're on the same setting. Uh, historically, uh, Muhammad was working with the Arabs in Arabia. Uh, they were a pagan people prior to Muhammad. Um, however, the god Allah, or the high god of the of the Arab Arabian excuse me, the high god of the Arabian pantheon, was Allah. And we see here, Muhammad's father's name was Abdallah, which literally translates the servant of Allah, or the slave of Allah. Uh, so we see in Muhammad's past there was a connection to this god. He did not create this god out of whole cloth. And so the, uh, the Arabs worshipped Allah, but m all the Arabs also worshipped dozens and hundreds, or at least revered and accepted the reality of dozens and hundreds of other deities. Um, and all of these deities were worshipped at the Kaaba, or that black box that you're familiar with from Mecca when you see pictures of the Hajj. Uh, all, all these deities are worshipped with their idols, their images inside that box. Except for Allah, he lacked an idol. For whatever reason, this high god of that pantheon had no physical form here on earth. Um, so over time, as the Arabs encountered and as Muhammad encountered Jews and Christians there in the Arabian Peninsula, Allah, the high god of the Arabian pantheon is identified with uh, Yahweh or Jehovah of 
the deity worshipped by the Christians and Jews. And then over the course of time, this is not Muhammad's invention, uh, but everyone seems to recognize that their high God, Allah, uh, He is the one who created the world. He is the one who will judge humanity in the final days. And oddly enough, be partly because the Arab community was Ill highly illiterate, more so than the Jewish and Christian communities, uh, their God, Allah, had not sent word through a prophet in Arabic, and he had not written any scripture down in Arabic. Uh, so there is a merger of how the God Allah was perceived prior to Muhammad, and then they come to realize that this non-physical high God should be equated with the Christian and Jewish God. And so it's not only that he created the world, uh, but it comes to be they recognize that this God was not just the high God, but the only God. So you'll get the phrase, the God, the only God is the God, or the only God is Allah. So suddenly they come to recognize what this supreme God in their pantheon is unparalleled in the same way and at the same time as they recognize that the Jewish and Christian deity is unparalleled and uncomparable. And suddenly Muhammad takes this role, he becomes the first Arabic speaking prophet of this God and he comes to unite uh, the Arabs together. Prior to this they had a, a horrible collection of laws, they seemed to work in a, uh, I guess, blood feud kind of mentality, uh, uh, very bar what we would consider a barbaric mentality, and so each Arabic tribe or Arabian tribe was battling with each other, killing off individuals, amassing money to be used against the others, and this it was just not a prosperous moment. So, uh, not only does Muhammad unite the tribes under one deity. Allah, he also introduces into them a mentality where you take care of the poor. He introduces to the Arabs this idea that there is any, an eternal soul or an immortal soul for each person, so you can't just willy-nilly kill somebody if they've crossed your family or somebody they're related to has crossed your family. So effectively, he doesn't just introduce monotheism to the Arabian tribes, he introduces a morality that makes uh, cohesion among the tribes sustainable. Uh, so uh, very much had a profound effect on judicial and theological grounds. But he also, in addition to saying, oh, this God, all of the high God, is the only God, he very much makes a point to connect Allah with the Jewish God. He holds fasts on Yom Kippur when the religion of Islam starts out. He intentionally picks Friday as a day for communal prayer so that his uh, group is worshiping at the same time as the Jews are preparing for their Sabbath. Uh, so everyone's in a religious worship reverent mode at the same time of the week. And at the beginning of time, at the beginning of his ministry, he has everyone face Jerusalem as part of their worship. In a few years, so from 612 to 622, give or take, uh, everyone's facing Jerusalem. In time, there will be a bit of a rift for good historical reasons between Muhammad and the Jews in his area, and he will want to maintain independence. So Islam will turn around away from Jerusalem to Mecca Medina. Uh, but the idea is originally based on the idea that Jews who live outside of Israel, wherever they are, when they pray, they pray to Jerusalem. Uh, think, for example, Daniel in the book of Daniel. Uh, we, we learn when he prays, he faces uh, that way. There's also this incredible tradition that worked out just right for Muhammad, the idea that in the Bible, we learn that Ishmael, the son of Abraham through the slave Hagar, is the father of the Arab people. Now, so this brings not just a 
theological connection and attempt to be a spiritual heir uh, to Islam, but they can trace their ancestry from this tradition to Abraham, who is considered to be the father of uh, father of monotheism, uh, the father of the Jews, the father of Christianity, in in some sense as well. Uh, so. This Ishmael connection makes this God more readily apparent and more readily accessible to the Arab uh, believers. And also, there's a tradition that has grown up that Abraham and Ishmael are the two who built the Kaaba in Mecca. So there's a connection. Abraham and his son, their ancestors, built the place, the house, where Allah is to be worshipped. So it's a very personal connection in this regard too. So very much Muhammad saw continuity with Israel, he saw continuity with Judaism, uh, the God of the Old Testament, and so his understanding of Islam is very much his God was their God. And keep in mind too, this is the same thing Christians do in the first century. They take the established religion and they develop the religion out of it. Christianity, Jesus is very much part of the Israelite tradition. Uh, and because in the ancient world you always look to whatever is old as to whatever is best, Christianity very, made a very, very significant point to connect itself to Moses and to the prophets and to David. So in the same way, Muhammad, seeing that which is ancient is the best, very much deliberately connected Islam with uh, Judaism and the God of the Old Testament. Um, and he, he says it multiple times, and I'll just uh, read one quick passage. It was we, the angels, who revealed the Torah, or the books of Moses. Therein was guidance and light, and by its standard, we have, been, we have been judged the Jews, and by the prophets who bowed to God's will, and by the rabbis and the doctors of the law. For to them was entrusted the protection of God's book, and they were witnesses thereto. And in their footsteps we sent Jesus, the son of Mary, confirming the Torah had been before him. And we sent him the gospel, and therein was the guidance and the light. And the confirmation of the Torah uh, had come before him a guidance and an admonition to those who fear God. Uh, so it's not just that Muhammad saw himself as another link in this chain. He felt this chain was so strong that Muhammad probably didn't quite understand that Christians and Jews were separate religious uh, communities. Uh, they were all followers of the same deity uh, from different prophets, of course, with different stories but they were all part of the same community. Now, as I said, admittedly, in the fa final years of Muhammad's tenure, uh, there is definite animosity between the Muslims and the Jews and the Christians, uh, mostly with the Jews, but I don't want to downplay that, but I want to say he very much saw this as a part of them, one religious community you know, of, of a sort, worshiping the same God. And as they're telling the same stories, uh, you'll see Adam, Noah, Abraham, Lot, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, and Aaron. These are all characters you know from Genesis and Exodus. These are all central fig figures in uh, the Quran. And, and as well, David, Solomon, Elijah, Elisha, Jonah, Zechariah, the son of John the Baptist. John the Baptist is there, as is Jesus and his gospel. Muhammad doesn't quite understand gospel the same way we do, just like he knew that the Torah was written by Moses. Uh, Muhammad may well have thought that the gospel was written by Jesus, and he might not have known the difference between what we consider the gospel and what we consider the Old Test or the New Testament. Uh, but he saw it all as one. Again, all prophets of the same deity. And, and then, of course. Babylon, the golden calf, creation, uh, so many uh, connections in history and story and in literature between these communities. 
to the point where I'd like to point out one idea. Muhammad must have been listening to the rabbis and the Christians tell their stories. Because in chapter 23 of the Quran, as the flood comes to destroy the world in Noah's time, it says, then our command, when our command comes, and the ovens, the oven gushes forth water, and take on board each kind, two and all of your family. So this idea, the oven gushes forth water, which is to suggest uh, we have a boiler exploding. Uh, it so happens this must have come from the the Talmud or the the Jewish law, where. We have a connection, it says in Sanhedrin 108b, Rabbi Hizda said, with hot passion they sinned, and by hot water they were punished. For it is written, and the water cooled. Uh, while it was said elsewhere, the king's wrath cooled. Uh, so here that Rabbi Hizda, he, he plays with Ge Genesis 8.1, the waters cool, meaning the waters must have been hot. So Muhammad heard this little story, this little tidbit interpretation, and he adds and said, it, the water didn't just burst out of the ground, but it's as though it burst out of the boiler, out of the ovens, so hot. Uh, so very deliberate literary connections, at least as deliberate as one can be for being illiterate. Um, so there's my reasons. We also have connections as Mary, uh, we have second century tr Christian traditions where Mary was raised in the temple and fed by God. We have references to that in the Quran. So very much uh, an attempt to recognize uh, his religion, his God, Allah, as the same God of the Jews and the Christians before him. So that's what I have to say. And so now we'll jump over to part two and hear what they have to say. Um, and even though I will show names and websites, as far as I can tell, or as far as I'm reacting, these people are anonymous. I, I don't know personally who they are. They're just meaningless names that I will use. Uh, so those of you out there who are these meaningless names, I apologize. Um, and again, uh, please be sparing in your comments if we allow for them on YouTube, uh, out there in the land of YouTube. I, my aim, and at least what I promised in the newspaper, was that I would look at uh, ideas, refusing the idea that Yahweh or Jehovah is Allah. I would, I would try to get a sample of writers from all three faiths, Islam, uh, Christianity, and Judaism. This proved to be difficult. Uh, if you type in the question to Google, is Allah Jehovah, or conversely, is Jehovah Allah, most all you will find are Christian responses to that question. Uh, so, for whatever reason, um, I guess if we're looking at the Fort Collins example and the Pledge of Allegiance, this is either the community that has the most access to the internet, the most time to spend on the internet, or uh, the one who feels that their way of life is the most threatened by this equation. Uh, so most of the material we'll look at here is uh, Christian. I, I did find one Muslim site uh, that answers this question, is Yahweh, or is Jehovah Allah? And we'll look at it. As far as any Jewish uh, websites, all I could find in my search were references to articles where Jewish authors identify Allah as Jehovah. Uh, so that's no fun. Um, so, so I won't re be reporting on those as much as saying it seems to be Jews are comfortable as far as my unscientific survey goes. Uh, Jews are comfortable with the idea that Allah is also to be recognized as the same God Jehovah that they worship. I did, however, find a Messianic Jewish website, and, and so we'll look at that in a moment. So, uh, a hybrid of sorts. So I don't have uh, the whole promise to show you, but hopefully this will be enough. 
Uh, the first one I'd like to look at, it's, the website is Answering Islam, and it seems the author of this particular article was Sam Shamoun. Um, interestingly enough, Answering Islam is written by Christians, and then I think there's a comparable Answering Christianity, which is written by Muslims. Uh, so wh whatever the title is, the religion of the author is probably the opposite. Um, but anyway, Shimon says, Are we to assume that just because the Quran states that Allah is Yahweh of the Bible, that both Jews and Christians are obligated to believe this to be true? Or do we examine the nature and attributes of Allah in order to compare them with the biblical portrait of Yahweh to find this to be the case? And of course, his answer ultimately is, for multiple reasons, he says, this is not the case. First, I want to point out that Christians and Jews, by recognizing Yahweh or Jehovah as the same entity as Allah, are by no means then obligated to believe only what the Quran says, or necessarily what the Quran says. Again, Muhammad had respect for, its pre for the previous sister religions, so there's no obligation on our part if we accept uh, this equation. And then he says, or do we examine the natures and attributes of Allah in order to compare them with the biblical portrait of Yahweh to find this to be the case? Hopefully I've shown you enough that there is um, nature and attributes that are common between Allah and Yahweh. Uh, uh, but our, our guy, Shamoon here, doesn't always seem that, seem that as also the case. And then he writes elsewhere, After all, if Allah is the God of Abraham, then Jews are, and Christians are, on, are wrong for not embracing Islam. But if Allah is not Yahweh, then Muslims are not worshipping the same God, only with a different name. Uh, so, again, he reiterates, if you accept that Yahweh or Jehovah is Allah, you are required to be a practicing Muslim. That's basically his takeaway from this comparison. Um, and so, therefore, his only anti-conclusion can be is Allah is not the same deity as Jehovah. Um, and he, he gives several reasons. First, he says the nature of Allah is he's a schemer. Uh, and this makes him very uncomfortable with this deity, as though the deity lies and deceives all the time. And he says at one point, God cannot be tempted, and he's talking here about the, the Christian deity, God cannot be tempted by evil or tempt anyone with evil. So, so, therefore, if Allah is a schemer, then Allah is tempting with evil, therefore he cannot be the Christian God. That's his point one. Uh, point two, he says, Allah is the author of abrogation, which is to say, new revelations given to Muhammad can contradict or replace earlier revelations. And for him, this means the God cannot be perfect. And his Christian God is perfect. So if the God ever changes his mind or ever changes the way he's going to relate to humanity or contact humanity or, or modify his message in any way, this God cannot be perfect. Therefore, Allah is not perfect. Yahweh is perfect. Therefore, they cannot be the same. And then finally, he says, the Quran has historical errors, which is fine by me, foreign words, which is fine by me, and grammatical errors, which is fine by me. Um, having read the Bible in Hebrew, I can promise you there are grammatical errors. Um, uh, having, uh, well, let's, let's look at these in comparison. First, he said, Allah is a schemer, and he says the Christian God cannot be tempted by evil or tempt anyone with evil. However, we find multiple places where the God of the Bible tempts the believer. In 2 Samuel 24, 1, we learn that God tempts David or incites David to sin, as the text itself says, uh, to take a census. 
the, the author of Chronicles is uncomfortable with I, this idea that Yahweh could incite David to sin, so he changes this story around in his version in uh, 1 Chronicles 21. He says, the Satan tempted or incited David to sin. Uh, so he's massaged it out, but this doesn't change the fact that 2 Samuel 24 explicitly says, the Lord Yahweh incited David to sin. So I think the Bible allows for the Christian or the Jewish God to tempt someone with evil. I don't think Christians accept this, but their texts say so. Uh, so there's Shamun's first problem with this issue. Uh, and there are other examples, uh, I do believe. Uh, the second is, Allah is the author of abrogation, which is to say, if the deity is going to change his mind and something can replace something that's been said, uh, then this deity cannot be perfect. However, the whole point of Christianity is that God now has a new kind of relationship and a new uh, way to interact with humanity. Uh, so the whole point of Christianity is that God has changed his mind. And that's kind of what Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, especially through 19 and 26. Uh, he says, you were under the law, now you are not. Uh, and that seems to be a change in the way the deity, what the deity has to say. Uh, so I find Shamun's response or answer here problematic uh, just for consistency within his own religious tradition. And then you can also add the idea after the flood, God starts a covenant with Noah, changing his relationship with mankind. With the advent of Abraham, there's a new covenant with mankind. With Moses, there's a new covenant with mankind. With David, there's a new covenant with Israel. And, and on and on and on. Uh, the biblical deity is constantly reinventing his relationship with mankind and what he is doing with mankind. Uh, so, I don't think change or replacing your message necessarily means imperfection. Unless it's a spelling bee. In which case, if you had it wrong the first time and then you spell it right, you still get disqualified. If you spell it right the first time, go back and spell it again wrong, you're disqualified. That's the only place where changing your mind gets you eliminated. Uh, within theology, I think there's room. And finally, he said, the Quran is full of historical errors. I didn't want to get into a full discussion about uh, moments in 2 Kings 18 and 19 where the Bible has a very different story of Sennacherib's besiegement of Jerusalem. Uh, but I, I decided to go with instead, if you look at Numbers 25, there's a story where the Moabite women seduce Israelite men to this big uh, orgy of a festival. In Numbers 25.9, we learn that 24,000 Israelites are killed or punished as a result of this orgy. In 1 Corinthians 10, St. Paul says there are 23,000. These numbers cannot be reconciled. Uh, so, either numbers is wrong. If somebody has to be right in a very literal kind of way, either numbers is wrong or Paul is wrong. Uh, so, since we're talking about a supposed report of a historic event, that would be one of those twos is a historical error. Uh, so there's this idea. Another one is simple enough to prove without being a biologist, and I, I bring this up because I mentioned it in class on Monday here. Leviticus 11.6 says that rabbits chew their cud. They don't. Um, simple enough. Uh, so whether you want to call that a biological error or a historical error, um, it's not accurate. Rabbits just chew their food really fast and chew a lot of food, so it looks like chewing cud to an observer. Uh, so uh, Shaman's problem with the Quran is also a problem with the Bible. Uh, therefore, I don't think it's a good problem. Uh, moving on to another uh, group, this one out of Colorado. Uh, the Colorado Christian University's think tank, Centennial Institute. Uh, they mention 40% of evangelical Christians now believe that Christian and Muslims 
worship the same God. And this is a problem for them. And they say, these two monotheistic faiths make separate and conflicting truth claims regarding salvation or eternity. And that's the reason Allah and Jehovah cannot be the same entity. Um, the problem here, I, I believe, is a really basic issue. Uh, and I think the Centennial Institute would agree with me that Jews and Christians have conflicting truth claims regarding salvation and eternity. Yet, I don't think the Centennial Institute would say that the Jewish God, Yahweh, and the Christian God, Yahweh, are incompatible or uncomparable or separate entities. Uh, so for this reason, and, and the whole point that Judaism and Christianity are two separate religions, are that they have different truth claims regarding salvation and eternity, even if they're using much of the same text to draw their conclusions. Uh, so for this reason, we can't extend or disqualify Islam and Allah uh, from the includedness. Uh, this brings us to a, a second point, one that the Centennial Institute doesn't actually make, uh, but I do believe Shamoon makes it, and then a website that's sponsored by the Baptist Pillar. Uh, they make this claim that Allah cannot be the same God of the Christian religion. Allah cannot be Yahweh because Allah is not triune. Which is to say, the Christian God is God the Father, God the Creator, God the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's fine, but again, neither is the Jewish God from a Jewish perspective. It is one deity in the same way that Allah is one deity. So denying Allah a triuneness is the worshippers perception of the deity, not, a, not the nature of the deity himself, or at least not reason to disqualify him, unless you want to say, again, Christians worship a different God than do Jews. And then here we have, and again, since the website is all about Muhammad, that means this is not a Islamic website. Um, and our author here complains, in the Quran, Abraham sacrificed Ishmael in Arabia, which is in contrast with Genesis 22, where Abraham attempts to sacrifice Isaac, his other son, by uh, Sarah rather than by Hagar. The problem with this, however, is that the Quran never actually says that Abraham sacrificed his son Ishmael anywhere. Uh, so it's not that he just has an objection to this. The author of All About Muhammad is flat out wrong. Uh, so in Surah or chapter 37, 99 through 107, we only get reference to this being Abraham's son. Islamic tradition does build upon this story and the lack of the explicit personal name. And today, if you ask most Muslims, does Abraham sacrifice or attempt to sacrifice Ishmael in the Quran? Most would say yes. Most, all who say yes, would still be wrong. Um, even if tradition builds up around it, that doesn't mean uh, that that's what the Quran says. Uh, just in the same way, if we want to press Christians, say, were there wise men with the shepherds on Christmas morning? Your nativity set sure says yes. Uh, the pageant you saw last year probably says yes, but the Bible never does. Uh, so there is very much a difference between tradition and textual uh, literal uh, readings. Uh, so that, that complaint is wrong. Or unvalid, I, I believe. Uh, also, he says, other biblical stories differ in characters too. So do Christian and Jewish retellings of biblical stories. And from Jubilees, a second century BC retelling of Genesis Exodus, all the way down again to your Christmas pageant that you saw last year. And finally, one complaint they mention is, Allah wants all adulterers killed. And this is what differentiates 
Allah from Jehovah because Jehovah wants to save the sinner. Never mind the fact that Deuteronomy 13 in three different paragraphs says if someone tries to lead you into an idolatry, be it a prophet, a family member, or a magician, or anybody, you kill that person. Uh, and again, we see in Revelation 13 and 14, anyone who bows down to uh, the image of the beast uh, is condemned to the lake of fire. Uh, so, which for me is tantamount to being killed, if not worse. Uh, so, these distinctions just are not there. Despite what these naysayers would say, uh, these are not good reasons to disqualify Allah from Jehovah being the same. And, and then, uh, as we near the end, the mess in Messianic Judaism, here at menorah.org, uh, here uh, the website name kind of corresponds to the religion, uh, menorah being Jewish, they say, Allah is not the God of the Bible. The biblical God is called Yahweh, or Jehovah, nearly 9,000 times, yet Allah is not called by that name even once in the Quran. Which, if you were just reading the Old Testament, this would be an interesting uh, point of argument. I don't think it's a good one, especially since this is a messianic Jewish website, which is to say, Jews who believe Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Because that means uh, they also would read the New Testament, and nowhere in the New Testament is the name Yahweh or Jehovah. So to say that the Quran fails to refer to the God as Jehovah or Yahweh is no different from saying that the New Testament, all of those, what is it, uh, 27 books, not one of them refers to the deity as Jehovah or Yahweh. He is the Lord or Kyrios at best, or perhaps the God. Uh, so this reason is not a good one. Just because of what you call the deity or don't call the deity is, is not um, determinative of whether these two deities can be identified. And then the menorah.org doesn't actually say this, so much, but I think they would they would uh, agree in I, so so I'll give them the blame, even though they don't totally deserve it. Uh, the purple one down at the bottom, Old Testament prophets foretold of Jesus as the Messiah, and they never talk of Mohammed. Uh, if you were a Jew who is not messianic, you will not find references to Jesus in the Old Testament. If you are not a Christian, and you go to the Old Testament uh, without any prior understanding, you will not find a prophecy of Jesus in the Old Testament. However, if you are looking for Jesus in the Old Testament, you will find Jesus in the Old Testament. And I'm sure many of you who have been told Jesus can be found in the Old Testament can find him there. Uh, so, sure, you can say the Old Testament talks about Jesus. Having said that, Muslims have found, or at least some Muslim apologists in years past, have found references to Muhammad in the Bible. Not just in the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament. Uh, for example, at the Last Supper in John, Jesus says, I will send my helper, my ad the advocate, or the Greek there is the paraclete. Uh, early Muslims said, this is a prediction of Muhammad as the final prophet, rather than the Christian interpretation that this is the Holy Spirit. Uh, likewise, Muslims have gone back to Isaiah 22, verses 6 through 9, and re in reference to riders on camels. How much more Arabian, how much more Mohammedan can you get than here you have this man on a camel? So there is Muhammad right there in both the New Testament and the Old Testament if you're looking for him. Uh, just there it is. Uh, so just because Allah is not a name found in the Old Testament, Muhammad's not a name that's clearly found in the Old Testament or New Testament, doesn't mean that believers can't find it there 
in the same way they found Jesus in the Old Testament. And, and finally, uh, one, one last uh, website. Here is the, the Islamic perspective. And, and the attempt here is to equate Allah with the Christian God. And so they say, Yahweh is a title, the Lord, not a name. They argue that Allah is actually God's name. And, and so, even though I think they're arguing for the right equation that Allah is Yahweh, this is factually wrong. Uh, as, I, as I told you, uh, Yahweh and then derivative Jehovah is very much a personal name. In the same way, my personal name is Spencer. Uh, so to say that it's a title is a misunderstanding. This is that Adonai, that word that comes to replace the name Yahweh in time, out of respect for the name Yahweh. So they see a translation of the Hebrew Bible in English as the Lord or my Lord, and they think that Yahweh is a title. Uh, so they're mistaken, even if their equation is on the same side that I would argue. And then they have this other idea that the Aramaic Elav, which is the God, is derived from the Arabic Allah, which means the God. Uh, as though Arabic were the primordial language uh, and Aramaic is derivative of Arabic. Um, which, that's a nice, I, I guess, I, I don't want to say the word fantasy, uh, but that's a nice thing to uh, believe in, but both Arabic and Aramaic trace back to a proto-European, or excuse me, a proto-Semitic language in much the same way French and Italian and Romanian go back to Latin, or Latin and Greek and English all go back to some proto-Indo-European language. The language spoken today is derived from the language from thousands of years ago, rather than English being the primordial language of Europeans, or Latin being the primordial language. Arabic is not primordial Semitic. It is a daughter language of proto-Semitic. Uh, so, the words are related, but they're not related because it's from Arabic. They're related because they're both from uh, Semitic words. Uh, so, ag again, uh, there's a lot of misinformation, and there's a lot of flimsy or unsustainable arguments, some that are trying to make the equation, some that are not trying to make the equation. Uh, so, now that I'm going online with this lecture in the co coming weeks once this video is rendered, I will be added to the mix, and hopefully I didn't add too much misinformation uh, to the topic. Uh, so, to conclude, Allah is Jehovah. These are three faiths worshiping the one same divine God. Thank you.